All right, I'm Dave Robinson, and we're talking about 40 years of legend, uh, about the time when I was managing director of Ireland uh, Records in the UK. And uh, we got the great joy of making this record, putting it together. So talking to Zeb and hoping for the best. How did you first meet Chris Blackwell? I met Chris Blackwell when I started Stiff Records. I mean, I knew him beforehand. He was a you know legend in the music industry. And uh, I started Stiff Records and I talked to him about distribution. So he, he, he gave me in introductions to his staff, his logistics staff, and they started pressing our first seven inches and potentially distributing them. Although we didn't have a, a contract of any kind. So we uh, we knew each other and we got started in that way, 1976. Did he ever approach you prior to 83 about working with no, you? No, he never did. But we had lunch. Every time he came to England, we would have a lunch. And uh, he'd kind of debrief me about the the music industry at that time because he knew I was busy with stiff records. And so... I was on the cusp of whatever was happening or making whatever was happening happen. So we would have lunch and, uh, you know, he is known uh, in the trade as the babyface killer. And I didn't understand what that meant until 1984. He wanted me to run Ireland and he hassled me a few times and he kept adding to the possible deal. He kept adding ingredients finally we agreed that he would buy half the company and we agreed on the price and uh so that's that's what happened he didn't mention to me that he was totally broke at the time i didn't assume he was broke because chris blackwell had been around forever ireland was a model of indie record company joy and it didn't occur to me i was kind of the smaller partner so I thought he would do due diligence perhaps about me, but I thought I knew what Ireland was having. They had a staff of over 100. Uh, they, had, they hadn't been doing that great in the, in the previous years, but they were, you know, they were surviving. It was, you know, Ireland, it was across the road. You didn't think Ireland are in trouble or whatever. It turned out they had no money at all. The first thing I did was, he had a he signed a, a label called ZTT, uh, run by Trevor Horn, who I also knew, who was also kind of a close friend. And I've been watching from my position as managing director of Stiff, I had been watching what was happening to a record he had called Relax. I've been watching it. It it had got to the uh, about sixty five in the UK charts. And what happens in the UK is it doesn't usually hang around. If you don't get it to move up in a couple of weeks, it kind of goes the other way. You know, radio stops playing it. It's very like a bullet in the American charts where you have to go up 10 places. In the UK, not so much 10 places, but you have to be look like you're moving. And this record got stuck. Uh, it's a very good sounding record. I wasn't, uh, you know, into the sexuality of it or anything. I was just watching a record in the chart. When I was in New York on a trip, I had gone to Ireland actually to get a couple of albums that they had that I didn't uh, have. And I'd seen there uh, a 12-inch called uh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Relax, The Sex Mix. And I had noticed it, and I had played a little bit of it just to see what it was about. And it was, um, it was about, it seemed to have a political thing about nuclear war. I can't remember it being very sexy. So Blackwell then hassled me over a couple of months to, um, to take on this job. I suggested to uh, the, the people in New York, Ireland, to send me 5,000 of this uh, sex mix because I thought, over Christmas, the English are inclined to relax a bit. And so I thought, if I get these 5,000 out in the shops, it says the sex mix, you know, people will want to maybe want to indulge themselves in a 12-inch called the sex mix. And so I cancelled everybody's uh, holiday, much to their 
dismay, Ireland 20-man sales force. I said, nobody's going on holiday. You can cancel everything you've got. You're going out into the shops. The uh, the guy in New York as well was a bit casual by my book. Stiff was a, I'm a pushy guy and Stiff was a, a you know, we were, I used to always say, we're, we're not hard, we're fast. And Ireland seemed rather slow and pedantic, right? So I spoke to the production guy in New York. I said, I need 5,000 of these next week. And he said, oh, there's no chance of that. It won't happen till after Christmas. I said, hang on a minute. Let me introduce myself. I'm the head of the UK company now. And let me tell you, if I don't have 5,000 of these fucking records on my fucking desk next week, you're fucking fired. He said, you can't fire me. I said, you just wait and see, boyo. So the 5,000 arrived and and the begruntled sales force took them out into the shops. And the first chart after Christmas, the record had got to 36, right? It had had the effect that, that I hoped for. And so Queen, Freddie, past Freddie Mercury, decided to stay in Bangkok or some other bloody place he was in. I can't stand Queen. And so a slot opened up on the TV show, which is the big thing at that time in the UK market, Top of the Pops, right? Opened up. And Michael Hurl, who I know well, called me and said, look, I'll take Frankie Goes to Hollywood at 34 because I'm stuck. He said, but I don't want them to do anything to anything, you know, unpleasant, Dave. I'll hold you responsible if they decide to do anything out of the ordinary. And the band showed up. They didn't show up for the rehearsal. They looked per perfectly normal. But for the um, show itself, they wore those kind of slightly kind of gay, uh, arseless chaps, you know, so their bums were sticking out, right? And they performed because... They can't stop you at that point, really, because the show is rehearsed. Michael Hurl called me on Monday and said, I will never take another band from you or from Ireland or from Stiff Records ever again. You are now banned from Top of the Pop. Your career is over. The record went to number six, right? Mm. So now we're really having a great time. We're at number six. And I'm thinking Michael will, uh, you know, he'll come around, you know, whatever. He banned me once before, about three years earlier, about a, another incident. So I'm just going on about this because it's important. We're having trouble pressing it. There's not enough capacity in Europe to press it. I'm pressing it all over the bloody place to get, because you get a few charts in England, you have to have the product. You can't not, you can't wait. So um that week, a gentleman called Mike Reed, who has the most important show on Radio 1 in the UK, nationwide radio, he takes the record off. He plays the intro and then he takes it off and he throws it at the wall. Everyone can hear it splintering against the wall. And he's saying, I'm not playing this obscene stuff again. Right? Well, you couldn't write this script, right? You just couldn't write it. We could not get pressing. We were we were out in Taiwan getting press. We were getting pressing all around the world because we sold 150,000 that Tuesday. They had a fairly kind of over the top video to go with the with the track, but uh, I played it to a couple of radio people who said there's no way that's going to get played on television. Television at that time very big help to sell the record, so. Uh, I shot another video with with um, a few lasers in in my warehouse, stiff warehouse, and we shot that in an afternoon. And ZTT hated it. The guy, <laughs> the guy called Paul Morley, who re recently has uh, written uh, Chris's book, he co-wrote wrote it. He uh, he was furious, and I said, "What is wrong with you? You cannot you cannot just produce some heavy." Uh, sexual art fucking thing that's of no fucking use. We're trying to sell records here. Your company owes Ireland a lot of money from the work that they did last year trying to sell this bloody record of yours. Selling records is my thing. So, you know, it, ridiculous. You know, shut up. Go away. You know, otherwise, you know, I'm not in the humor to talk. Blah, blah, blah. 
you know, fairly over the top stuff. The record sold like hotcakes. And then, uh, and I give them Paul the the uh, the credit for coming out with the T-shirt. He didn't just come out with a T-shirt that said, relax, don't do it. He came out with a kind of a garment, a kind of a white, very nice garment, and people just couldn't get enough of it. So that was my first thing. During this time, I had a board meeting, my very first at Ireland, and discovered that they didn't have any money. I had to lend them. I lent them a million pounds so they could pay their staff a couple of months. They didn't have any money, but Frankie Goes to Hollywood was starting to, this track was making a big dent in the creditors. You know, So I talked to all of them. I said, look, we're going to really turn the company around. It's going to be fantastic. And they were all the same creditors as Stiff had because they were all uh, manufacturers of, of packaging and labels and all the pressing. So it was good. And we, you know, I believe Blackwell went to Medem, which is a big uh, festival of publishers in January in, in the south of France. And he swanned about being congratulated by everybody on his number one record, etc. So as a start of, a, of an operation, it was very good. And, you know, I'm not a I mean, I've got the normal e ego, et cetera, but I'm not an egotistic person. I then needed to to find product in Ireland that would help with the pay bill. And also, I wanted to be paid back for a start. Right. Blackwell then said to me, what about a greatest hits uh, for Bob Marley? And he he gave me some artwork, a very good picture. It was a picture of Bob live where he had turned his head sharply during his his dance. And the dreadlocks had come out from his head. It looked like a pilgrim's hat. It was a very interesting picture. You may see it nowadays. It's still as great as it was then. And he gave me a running order that he said, he said, this is more or less the running order I am visualized. So why, you know, and I said, well, I don't like the running order, and I, that picture is great, but it's not what I want to use on Bob Marley. And he said, what do you mean? Because he was used to people, say, kowtowing to him. He was used to his managing director saying, yes, Chris, yes, Chris. Chris never was in the office. Everything had to be sent to him wherever he was, and he was normally in Jamaica or in the Bahamas or whatever. And he would then, you know, smoke a big chalice of uh, herb and then forget all about getting back to people saying, "Is yeah, put this out or change this or whatever. He was notorious for this. And that's why Ireland were in the dumper at the time. You know, really, he'd taken his eye off the target. I said, you do it or I'll do it. There's no way. I don't think uh, greatest hits are done by committee, right? I have a feeling that uh, the white... Uh, English audience think uh, Bob is anti-white a bit. Not dramatically, but they're not a huge... I found out as well, I looked at the uh, sales figures, and the uh, sales figure for Exodus, which was Bob's big record, you know, I, I'm a big Bob fan. You know, I'm listening to his stuff. And I found that it sold 189,000 units. This is two years after he had died. So the kind of flurry that you normally get, unfortunately, when people pass on, that kind of where people want to stock up on their latest record, it hadn't particularly had a big effect. And I realized, because I'd never, I'd never asked before, that really Bob was a cult figure. He wasn't really a big star. Ireland always trump about him being a big star, but he um, was a cult figure very good. I loved his music. And um, a lot of their pictures of him, when I looked into the uh, library at Ireland, were kind of him in, in uh, military military camouflage clothing. He's playing football or he's doing anything. And not a lot of the pictures were laughing, smiling. I think Chris Blackwell, what he did is uh, he, he looked at Bob's pictures and he'd X out the ones he didn't want using if he had a photo session. And he X'd out all, he wanted Bob to look a bit tough and to be that kind of revolutionary rebel. Now, he was that anyway. I couldn't see, 
you know, my attitude about selling things as well. I did a lot of research. He didn't want me to do any research. I went and I knew a guy who did quantitative research that I'd had a very good experience with a few years earlier. And I said, I want you to go in. I want you to look at the kind of record that the public are going to want. So legend was easy because everybody said he's a legend. And I thought he was a bit of a legend as well, but it, that was an easy one, right? I didn't need to have paid for that. But uh, we looked at the running order and the records that people liked and their attitude about Bob. These are these are people who bought reggae records, who, who you know, who had a, bought a reggae record in the last year, you know, you know, so they kind of, you know, they had, they were the, the market. So, so we put it together. I took a while to find the picture, Adrian Boot, had photographed Bob left, right, and center, but Chris had dumped all the kind of pretty picture, not the pretty one, but I wanted one that showed Bob as a songwriter. I'm a big songwriter fan. So I wanted the songwriter uh, to come across, you know, the guy, the philosopher, thinking about, reasoning about the world and and looking interesting. And then this one with uh, Haile Selassie's ring turned up and he's wearing blue denim, Bruno Tilly, who you who you know and introduced us, uh, Bruno Bruno was used to Ireland and Blackwell and the way Ireland worked, which is very different to how Stiff worked. Stiff is very guerrilla minded, very very up and at him, in your face a bit more. And so Bruno was very good. He he adapted to me quickly. We had a few good chats. I liked his art. He's a very classy art art guy. But he's understood what I'm, you know, I gave him this rant that I'm giving you. I gave him pretty much this and he understood what was happening. So we we looked for the picture. My wife was heavily pregnant with our second child, Jack. And Ireland offices were very close to where I was living now. I'd moved house because Ireland and Stiff was a big job and I was going to be home late every night and I was going to, you know, so I moved close. So I would pick her up at lunchtime and there's a motorway near where Ireland were in St. Peter's Square, motorway out to the west of uh, London. I'd pick her up because she's a reggae fan. And also I'd see her for lunchtime, which is rather nice. So 20 minutes out on the road, because we're looking at vinyl and 20 minutes back, A and B side, right? And uh, we uh, did this for about five weeks. And eventually uh, our son, who was about to arrive, Picked her so soundly because um, I had a very big stereo in my car and it was loud. He <laughs> he got really crazed about it. He nearly murdered her. And so, in my book, he came up with the running order. Funny enough, he is now a, a, a music promoter. He promotes a lot of festivals and various, and they're all bass end festivals. They're all reggae and reggae music festivals. So. The, the next thing was TV advertising. Ireland had never TV advertised. I was amazed. I mean, TV was the way to get to the, when you've got a greatest hit and when you're, you know, you need the money and also you need to do something for Bob Marley. Uh, that's the way forward. So I, I shot the uh, ad. I ran the whole thing from beginning to end. I got crazed about it. I got very, very focused. And we, uh, I even remixed a couple of singles that nobody has spotted so far on the, on the album. I put digital echoes, only the same. They sound exactly the same, but digital echoes sound. It sounded a bit dull. One or two of his early singles sounded a bit um, kind of eight track or sixteen track. You know, they were a bit dull, heavy bass distortion, and we smoothed them out just a little bit so I could reissue them as singles. A guy called Julian Mendelssohn. Julian Mendelssohn, remember that name? He's Australian, and he worked at Sarm Studios. He's a great remixer, and I used him rather than any of the reggae remixers that maybe Blackwell might have used. So it, the story really is Blackwell saw Bob Marley and the Wailers as a, a rock reggae. That was his concept behind it, but I translated it into fact, right? So, marvellous. The cassette was a great success. The album came out uh, April 4th, I think, 1984. That's the day my son was born. We uh, printed the, the album on, on a very fancy chrome 
uh, cassette, you know, the best kind of tape going, less hiss, great sound. And I came up with a with a a kind of a perspex tube, a rectangular tube that had the cassettes in it and a little slot at the bottom where you could take one out, right? So it was a box and it had sticky feet. So I had my salesman go around the entire uh, chart shop, all the shops that counted, and they stuck it beside the till. So this Perspex box with all these uh, little cassettes that looked like cigarettes, I got the idea from cigarettes. So <laughs> with a with a cassette at the top, and people couldn't resist pulling out the bottom one. They couldn't resist it. That summer, uh, every beach in the world had a cassette of Bob Marley playing. You couldn't take the vinyl. We didn't have CDs at that time, right? So the cassettes were playing all all over, and it just snowballed. Some people have uh, accused me of softening up Bob Marley or whatever. It's not at all true. He's a great songwriter in any genre, and all his songs are political. All of them, they're political. Even when he's singing to his women, he's political. So uh, I also knew that this would open up the entire back catalogue, which obviously had very poor sales. You know, it, it, they were cult sales. All of them had had uh, numbers that were good, but weren't great, right? That's the, pretty much the Bob Marley story. People talk about 25 million or thereabouts. There, it's 44 million. I keep a very, very strict. Uh, it's about 44 million now. And Universal have tried to remix it. They've drawn the Marley kids in to do this and that. It's all shit. You know, it's all rubbish. But it's a record company trying to, you know, inveigle the Marley Empire now. It's great. You know, they sell more coffee than they do everything else. And they're all bright kids. Uh, Sedella is fantastic. I haven't seen the movie, but several people who went to see it who knew Bob and did work with Bob, they liked it. They liked the idea of trying to make him. They, they say, well, the same reason that you did some track listing with legend is the reason that this movie it's made to be general so people could kind of get on him really because as a revolutionary and things uh you know the world still hadn't got quite so uh I, i'm going to see it probably next week and i hope you will too so, but <laughs> um, <laughs> you know it's uh it's very difficult to do i mean you know when you're having a guy uh, impersonating Bob and smiling all the time, or all the pictures of him smiling, it we might be going the other way too much. He was a he was a remarkable man, and a remarkable history made him really his uh, white father and his uh, black uh, mother in a little town in the back of nowhere. I mean, it's, a, it's an extraordinary story, and um, you could make the hard version of it. You could make the gritty version the same way. Blackwell put out an album after I left to Ireland, put out a, a, a another album which did nothing. He used a harder picture and he put the politi all the kind of political songs on there. You're referring and it, to rebel music? Yeah. 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 It did it it did okay, but it did nothing. You know, it didn't take off. The public didn't, you know, a few fans would see it. The thing about songwriters is you're looking for the songs that appeal to the to the mass market. That they're the ones that get remembered forever. In terms of Blackwell, uh, I mean, I left, you know, uh, because essentially he double crossed me, and his staff did too. So they didn't pay some of uh, Stiff's bills because we had joined together accounts department and whatever. They didn't pay some some of their bills, but they paid. Uh, eventually, I mean, we turned the company around completely. We paid off all his debts, and eventually, he was able to sell it for two hundred and eighty-nine million, or a lot of money. Um, uh, yeah, but he went along with his staff, not remembering because our deal at the beginning was, "I want you to come here, Dave. I, I'm not going to look over your shoulder. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I, I'll take it as read." We we came up with the value of it. And that's the value of it. So I had to come up with the value to get you to come. So uh, it was one of those things. I never got paid. And my front, I was supposed to be um, 
the companies were supposed to be sold down the road. I mean, that was part of the deal and we would build them up to sell them, but that was never done. And, um, you know, he probably owes me about 12 million plus interest. Now, Chris and I still talk to each other. We still have a relationship. I mean, we email each other and we, you know, I'm fond of him and uh, I like him. But, uh, you know, he fucked up my life a bit. However, <laughs> that's the story. So you that's the whole story. I haven't told all of that to anyone before.